Hello, everyone. Welcome to the ninth week of the Quant University Summer School. Today, we are fortunate to have Jörg Kenitz. I hope I pronounce your name right, Jörg, and then Ben Steiner. And then we are going to be presenting on this whole area about validation in machine learning. And primarily, we're going to look at the whole area of deep learning networks. Over the last eight weeks, we have looked at different themes in machine learning, both from a a modeling perspective and also from a model risk management perspective. We have looked innovative ways in which machine learning is making an impact in the financial services area. Uh, we have looked at synthetic data generation, factor investing. We have looked at the whole area of interpretable machine learning. We have looked at startups and investment perspectives on explainable AI. And we have kind of covered a lot of uh, themes and discussion in the quantitative finance industry primarily when we are adopting data science and machine learning solutions. And this week, we are going to talk about two perspectives, one on the P side, you know, uh, quants, you all know there's the P quant and the Q quant. So we're going to talk about the P side of the story and also the Q side of the story. And it's going to be a fascinating discussion. I've heard both Jörg and Ben talk about their research in the past, and I'm very excited to have you both today presenting at the Quant University Summer School. So welcome virtually. I know you're all uh, we're all you know, coming from different uh, uh, geolocations. You know, I'm based out of Boston. Ben, uh, you're based out of New York. And Jörg, you're based out of Germany. We have a lot of participants from different parts of the world. In fact, in the summer school, we have had uh, participants from um, 13 different countries who are taking our machine learning and model risk management courses. So for people who are not familiar with Quant University, we are a data science advisory based out of Boston. We focus mainly on the intersection of data science, machine learning, and quantitative finance. And this summer, we have been hosting academics, thinkers, innovators who have been working on different areas of quantitative finance, but also looking at the intersection of how the various frontier technologies like machine learning, fintech, and other areas are kind of influencing the whole financial services area. Uh, and in the, the, in the same uh, stream, we have uh, uh, had uh, 12 different speakers over the last nine weeks, and we are expanding that whole summer school concept into an autumn school, and we are primarily going to be focusing on scalable machine learning, model governance, and this whole area of fintech post-COVID-19. So we are going to look at how things are changing and how things are going to be uh, you know, interesting in the context of investing and also about uh, bringing in all these frontier technologies into the financial services enterprise. And we are offering a bunch of new courses. And for people who are interested in looking at some of the course offerings, we are going to be doing uh, our first FinTech bootcamp, uh, partnering with Premier, and that's going to start October 20th. So you will get all, uh, you'll all get an email about some of the links I'm actually showing to you right now. And uh, you'll have the opportunity to register and also look at some of the details about the various programs. So without further ado, let me introduce you to our uh, speakers of the day. Uh, Dr. Jörg Kenetz, uh, he's a partner at uh, uh, Quaternion Risk Management and he has uh, worked on various areas in applying machine learning in finance. I got to know about Jörg's work uh, when I was at MathWorks and when he came out with this amazing book. And that was one of the first uh, books which uh, I picked up when I was looking at risk management and kind of wanted uh, a practitioner's perspective, but also someone who was very uh, familiar with MATLAB and was very interested in MATLAB. So I was able to like pick up the book and uh, uh, Yarg, when I, uh, uh, when I, when you and I had a call, I showed you my copy, uh, which is actually just uh, a few meters away from me. So I keep looking back at that book. And um, uh, he also teaches at the University of uh, Opital and I let Yarg formally introduce himself and talk about his work. And we also have Ben Steiner from uh, BNP Paribas. And Ben and I go a long way. Uh, uh, kind of, we got to know each other from our uh, interests in both SQA and also in MATLAB. I think we met at a MATLAB conference and Ben is a big proponent of responsible machine learning. And uh, he has very passionate views about, you know, how the world has to operate in the context of responsible adoption of machine learning and AI. And I'm very, very, um, uh, you know, whenever I have a discussion with Ben, I it just gets, you know, a half an hour call gets to a one hour call because I, I love uh, talking to him about all these uh, concepts and uh, 
Uh, he comes from a perspective of uh, what is practical and what is pragmatic when you think about adopting these solutions. You know, we have the theoretical angle, but we also need to operate in a practical world. Um, so he's going to present the perspective. And Ben also teaches at Columbia University various courses in risk management and operationalizing some of these aspects. And I think yesterday he was mentioning about he had a whole lecture on explainable AI and uh, using responsible machine learning concepts. So um, uh, Ben, thank you so much for uh, coming down. So the way we're going to do today's event, so today's event has been extended to an hour and a half event. Uh, so we are going to have uh, Dr. Yarg present first. And he's going to be presenting the Q side of story. And he's going to talk about Heston models and some of the various aspects of machine learning. And then Ben is going to talk about some of the, uh, the P side of the story, talking about various aspects in terms of uh, alpha strategies and factor investing and some of the cool concepts he's been working on in the last few years. So uh, without further ado, I will hand over the, the podium, the virtual podium to York. OK, thank you very much. So should let me make you the host. OK, thanks. OK, so you should be able to share your screen, York. Here we should go. I hope everybody can see it. Yes, we can see you. Yeah. Thank you very much for the nice introduction, Sri, and uh, the possibility to give a talk here at uh, Quant University Summer School. So uh, that's very exciting for me. And uh, you already outlined that there is some more exciting stuff coming up in the autumn school, and uh, uh, there would be very nice lectures and uh, ideas you can pick up uh, in the forthcoming events. And I hope I can contribute to this summer school also with an interesting talk. Uh, so if you want to have more information on myself, I want to keep this uh, time for uh, presenting myself very short. You can visit the Finciraptor page here. It's in, in uh, the slides and you get an overview of my work and uh, what I'm uh, doing and uh, uh, see some of the examples. You can download uh, certain stuff with regard to the books and so on. So for this talk, actually, uh, I want to give an, an overview uh, of... Uh, the concepts uh, of machine learning in the beginning, so uh, a basic introduction of uh, what uh, we are doing and uh, then uh, want to lead you to the way uh, that we can consider deep neural networks for financial problems and specific financial problems, namely problems from what Sri named uh, Q-quant perspectives, so especially option pricing and calibration. <clears throat> so actually there are uh, mainly three parts uh, or three areas of machine learning. So we have the supervised machine learning. A lot of applications are supervised machine learning applications. And in uh, supervised machine learning, uh, we need to uh, have data sets which have input data and which is also a part which is a labeled data type or a label to a data. So this means we would have a... a a set here of pairs x and y. So x would be the input data and y would be the label. So we can think of, for example, if we directly go into the uh, q-quant perspective, x1 might be a vector of Heston pricing parameters. So something like a correlation, wall of wall, uh, a mean reversion whatsoever. So some type of option pricing parameters. And Y, of course, might be an option price uh, at a given time or at a given strike, or even a whole volatility surface. So that depends on how you structure your data. But for supervised learning, it is essential that you have input parameters and to these input parameters, some labels. So we denote it by X and Y. So that's uh, our setting for supervised learning. And actually what I'm presenting here is based on supervised learning. Uh, there are other disciplines, for example, this unsupervised learning. Uh, there, these labels are missing. So uh, we might to apply some uh, cleverly constructed algorithms uh, that are somehow inferring, or they do not reference to labels, uh, but they try to uh, somehow uh, take the data and make something with the data. Maybe they can cluster it, they reduce the dimensionality, they group it, and so on. And uh, that's uh, called unsupervised learning. We're not considering unsupervised learning here. Then there is an, 
a very nice and interesting area which is called reinforcement learning and it's something in between I would say. Uh, so reinforcement learning actually involves uh, some agent acting with an environment and uh, following some policy and in the end for his choice, for, his, uh, for the agent's choice, it's getting a reward. So it's implicitly supervised because of this reward function and actually this is also uh, applied in asset management and in uh, uh, hatching and uh, um, constructing portfolios in a way for, for hatching for example. And it's an interesting problem but again we are not considering reinforcement learning here. Um, yeah, what are the uh, typical applications of machine learning? It's on the one hand side classification. You know of course all the famous MNIST data set where you classify handwritten digits. digits. And uh, there are several uh, methodologies. Uh, maybe some sound familiar to you, maybe some not. Uh, so for uh, classification you want to um, get out of the labels um, or the labeled data in supervised learning an algorithm which learns from the inputs the, and can classify them into one of the categories where the labels are from. So the labels might be from n categories. So in the MNIST data set there might be 10 labels, 10 numbers. But it could also a 0-1 decision. Something like this is something true, is something false. So this would be a binary classification. And examples include uh, famous methods like support vector machines for example. This is illustrated here in a linear case, in a non-linear case, so in various uh, uh, different shapes can uh, these uh, uh, classification or methods arise. Random forest classification is another one. I've uh, given here an example on uh, several uh, steps in using random forests in here, but it's also not for, for us today. We use neural networks and actually neural networks can also be used for classification. There are many uh, uh, ideas of uh, applying neural networks for classification problems. And for example, the MNIST dataset is always a good starting point there. And uh, we are focusing on neural networks. But neural networks and other machine learning um, techniques can also be used for regression. And uh, that's particularly interesting because uh, what I'm showing later on is really a regression problem. So uh, we want to learn a continuous type, labels that are continuous in a way, and uh, uh, this means for changing option pricing parameters, for example, in the Heston model or simply in the black scholes model, if volatility changes, the price of an option changes and the implied volatility changes. In a way. So we are considering regression. Um, yeah, all other uh, listed uh, methods here, again, support vector machines, random forest, can be applied to regression as well. So it's, it's not something special to neural networks here. There are other techniques like simple linear regression, Gaussian process regression, um, going further to Bayesian neural networks. So it's everything is linked in a way in machine learning. So uh, cat uh, classification and regression can be done with the same type of techniques. Then there is something like clustering, there are many examples for clustering. We are not considering this here because uh, we are working on regression problems. Others, again, dimension re uh, dimensionality reduction, a very famous example, PCA. It's a linear variant uh, in a way, and uh, these are in fact linear, so-called variational autoencoders. If we do this with a neural net, we might use nonlinear, really variational autoencoders, we could uh, use manifold learning here to uh, somehow learn uh, or get some structure out of unlabeled data. But again, not uh, the topic for today's talk, but just to embed this neural network stuff and what I'm going to do in a broader context. I just wanted to show these uh, different areas of applications and maybe we see or you see it in, in further courses and lectures that some of these methods are are used. So supervised learning, unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning. We are doing supervised learning. And uh, now I want to also discuss some concepts which are 
yeah, common to all machine learning problems. And I'm using these concepts that uh, might be some easy uh, to grasp ideas to apply it later on in a neural network contents when I want to use the neural networks for solving pricing applications and keeping the model selection and the model risk at a certain level. But everything is reflected in how you use a machine learning model. And here it is, it's actually that we choose a class of a model, so we stick to supervised learning, we stick to regression. Then if we have chosen some type of method, maybe we chose now the neural network uh, stuff, we have to choose the hyperparameters. So what are hyperparameters? It's first of all uh, some parameters which are given when you have chosen a model. For instance, in a linear regression, the hyperparameters would uh, nothing be than the coefficients which you use uh, in your linear regression or in standard regression. It's the uh, coefficients. You're fitting a polynomial, the hyperparameters are the uh, coefficients of your uh, um, in front of your polynomials. So uh, that's uh, the hyperparameters. In neural network, we will see later on, there are many hyperparameters which we have to consider. And then we need to fit the model to data, to training data. But this is only part of the story because uh, it does not really uh, suffice uh, to use only uh, training data here. Uh, because we will see uh, in a few seconds uh, that we may run into trouble if we only do it on training data because there is something which we call a bias and we call something or we see something which is a generalization. So we want to use our trained model to fit data very well but we also want to apply it not only to the data we know but also to new data. And there we go from a bias, which is the error we make in a training data by fitting a, a regression, a neural network, a support vector machine in, and use it on new data, we observe that it might fit very well to the new data, or it doesn't. So how can we, can we transfer this concept and keep a level of a bias and the generalization? So that's all what we have to keep in mind uh, when we work uh, with machine learning applications in models. And one task, actually two tasks which are very closely tied together is the model validation in terms of uh, applying a machine learning model and the model selection here. So these are tied very closely together because when we select a model we have also to do a validation and uh, it, it's not only uh, yeah, just taking a neural net, taking some uh, uh, nodes, taking some layers, training it to data, and see what happens. It's, uh, it's more to that. So we, uh, we have to get familiar with the data. We uh, shouldn't be too complex. We shouldn't be too flexible. And that's all reflected in this process of model selection and model validation. And especially uh, the model validation there are some do's and don'ts and these are uh, common to all machine learning models actually. So it's selecting the data, training the model, determine the loss actually, the bias in there and then uh, using another set of uh, data points to study the generalization error in a way. So how does it perform on unseen data? And this is often done by uh, splitting a given data into one large set for training, one smaller set for validation, and then maybe also another set for doing the real testing of a validated, trained model in a way. There are some standard uh, applications uh, or methods which you can use uh, for model validation here, called K cross, uh, K for cross validation, leave one out estimation, and so forth. You find it in the standard literature actually. So for the model selection, which we have to do, uh, we have somehow uh, also to solve a, a very complicated problem, namely, which is known in philosophy as the Occam's razor principle. So 
being as complicated as necessary, being as flexible as necessary, but not too complicated. Because we would like to choose the easiest, the simplest model, which can cope with a given uh, universe of uh, complexity. So that's uh, the art in applying machine learning problems. And I want to illustrate it by this uh, variant, uh, bias variance uh, trade-off. So fitting data, doing an error on a training set, the bias, and something uh, which is then called the generalization. So here, for example, we have a high bias model. So this is just some data points, and I'm just fitting a linear uh, graph in here, uh, uh, doing a regression. Of course, it gives errors, and we can do better by choosing a high um, degree polynomial, for example. It fits much better, but we see uh, this is a low variance model, but with a high bias. This is a low bias model with a high variance. And now, if we train this model here, we see we can keep the bias very small. But now, if we apply it to new data, so the red points here, we see, of course, the linear model does not really perform that well here, but actually it behaves in the same range as uh, on the training data. It's, uh, the high bias model, in a way, keeps its properties also for unseen data. But whereas the complex model here gives a very, very bad validation score. So that's a problem. It overfits to the training data. This might underfit to the training data. This, of course, overfits. And there is something uh, which we want to, to, to level out. So a good fitting, not an underfit, not an overfit, and a nice generalization. And that's what we call the bias variance trade-off in a way. And a method for doing this is to calculate a training score and a validation score, and at some stage, find a level between both, uh, uh, both uh, um, values, the bias and the variance. And this is something we call the sweet spot. So something, something nice where we are secure that some uh, level happens uh, uh, in, in um, yeah, matching errors or uh, reducing errors on the training set and having a nice generalization property. And actually, this is the same idea which we pursue in uh, five minutes when we consider neural nets here. So we can think of a straight line as a, a very simple neural network, for example. It's a very, very simple one. Maybe just one layer, some nodes, very simple activation functions, just a feed-forward neural network, very simple one. It might not do the, the job very good. Here we increase the degree of the polynomial, and we can think of a higher degree polynomial as a more complicated neural network. Maybe with a different topology, maybe having uh, different uh, uh, ideas of how to apply a, a activation function, maybe adding layers, maybe adding nodes. Increasing the degree even higher gives more flexibility. We can add a certain different type of neural network. There are a zoo of neural network. It's not just feed-forward neural network. We can apply a, a whole different geometry here. And you can think of in the same terms here as we do with simple linear and polynomial regression. So the blue line, the simplest neural network, the others are more complex architectures in terms of weights, of uh, um, to network topologies, and so on. And what we want to do is we want to find a sweet spot on the uh, different uh, um, training data sets we use, and what happens if we increase the size of the data set or use it on uh, validation sets. And we see here, in this case, a simple neural network might be selected here by, in this case, polynomial equal to 3. So in, uh, in, in this case, for a simple model, a relatively simple model, it's easy to determine this sweet spot here. If we have more data, we see on the one hand side the model can be more complex. So we can, for example, use here a higher degree polynomial. In neural network terms, 
We might use a much more complicated neural network, a bigger neural network whatsoever. But the sweet spot is not so easy to, to, to find out here. But what we are interested here, we do not want to go here into this complexity, despite it gives good uh, reasons. But now think of Occam's razor principle again. We want to do something in this range here, maybe degree 5 for the polynomials here, which does a very good job. So that is our guiding idea, this bias variance trade-off here. To uh, somehow level this bias variance trade-off, we can also use something which is called feature engineering to put in more uh, um, values calculated on the given input data to stabilize the results. But with the advent of deep neural networks, deep neural networks have something, a mechanism built inside due, because they are somehow deep, uh, they are uh, designed uh, to do an internal feature engineering type. So, you might stick to feature engineering by yourself, it's very complicated, or use a little bit more complicated neural networks. So neural networks, actually, the main theme of this uh, talk for the next uh, 12 uh, minutes I have left. Uh, we want to train a neural network, we want to uh, investigate if we use shallow networks or deep networks, and we want to discuss the, uh, the applications to option pricing and calibration, and then doing some model validation and uh, risk validation in there. If you want to get an idea what's uh, uh, going on here, you can visit the Playground TensorFlow Oak uh, site, and here you get a, a, a possibility to play around with different uh, architectures of neural networks, and you can try it out. So this Occam Razor principle directly here, it's uh, uh, it's very nice, so you can really add the complexity. You can increase the number of neurons, you can increase the number of layers, and you see that the network, of course, can do more, but it gets very complicated. And at some stage, uh, you will find that what they illustrate here, so the values somehow of the weights of the nodes, uh, look pretty much the same, or that only a few nodes have very strong connections and the others can be neglectable. So you're doing something wrong if you just add a lot of layers, a lot of nodes, and so on. So and that's really nice illustr uh, nicely illustrated at this page. I can only recommend to, uh, to, to play around with this uh, page and see uh, what's happening there. So the easiest or the most easiest uh, way to uh, think of a neural network is to uh, consider as a, here like a graph. So we have some input nodes. The Heston parameters, for example, uh, or in black scholes, just the volatility. And we have in-between nodes, or so-called hidden nodes, uh, in there. This network has two hidden layers, and it has then three output nodes, three in the, in the last layer. And each node is constructed like this guy here. So it gets some, uh, val uh, some input values. It multiplies with its own weights here adds a bias, puts it in a so-called activation function, and computes the output which goes to the next node in here. Or if it is an, uh, the, the output node, this is one of the values we are calculating. Here you see a different selection of uh, um, uh, different activation functions. And what's actually happened inside, you can think of this neural network here as a function interpolator. So this network is capable of approximating complicated functions uh, by selecting the weights and the biases such that it somehow creates uh, um, functions which are called somehow step functions. It's uh, approximating a very complicated functions with, say, step functions. And this is done by selecting the weights and the biases by what we uh, call with a backpropagation algorithm. So we put in data here, we let it run through the network, we compute a loss, mean square error whatsoever, put it into an optimizer, which is often something which is called stochastic gradient descent, and it's implemented in TensorFlow, PyTorch, and every package you use for neural networks. And uh, it suggests a new set of hyperparameters, again, 
runs the, uh, the data through the neural network, computes the loss, and do it again and again until we reach a nice uh, value for the loss function. Then we keep the weights and the biases, and we have trained our neural network. I do not want to go into the details of stochastic gradient descent or backpropagation, but uh, keep in mind that these things are implemented in these uh, frameworks like TensorFlow or PyTorch. If you want to see what a neural network can do in, uh, in pricing, for example, I would suggest to visit this pricer, uh, riskfuel.com. And what you see here is uh, it calculates Bermudan swaption prices for a term structure model here and it compares the results to uh, the open source quantlet library. You can play around with volatilities, with yield curves, with uh, uh, terms of the swap chain, and this neural network is always very, very, very fast and very accurate in here. And if you see uh, the quantlet implementation, it's, it's really slow at some stages, if, at uh, most when the calibration is done and if the uh, corresponding maturity is very large. And this is the model they have implemented. It's the so-called Hull-wide term structure model uh, with uh, time-dependent volatility here, which is calibrated to the observed uh, swaptions, and then uh, um, a Bermudan swaption is priced. That can be done. We also did it and uh, released an article in the Journal of Machine Learning in Finance where we used only synthetic data. We created... Uh, yield curves in there and volatility data, trained a neural network and did the pricing as risk fuel that did, uh, but not on uh, very complicated architectures on uh, high dimensional NVIDIA uh, processors and uh, clouds, but on a notebook. And actually what we observed, it, it, way, it works. It's, it's really nice. It can be done in Keras TensorFlow, for example, and we see uh, here the training and the validation error and it gets somehow to the point where we can really use it for uh, option pricing. Another application, I want to skip that, is calibration. So here's the Heston model. It's a complicated model, more complicated than Black Scholes in a way. It can uh, deliver uh, several shapes of, yield, uh, of volatility curves in here. Uh, so the different parameters have different meanings and different effects on how the volatility surface is structured. And we are interested, if we observe a volatility structure in the market, what are the corresponding Heston parameters? So working in a, uh, not the way having the parameters, calculating uh, uh, the prices, but vice versa. And uh, we could use uh, a neural net as well there for, for doing that. And here we have uh, trained a neural network to do the pricing, and then we fit the pricing into some... Uh, um, yeah, uh, optimizer to get the parameters out. You can find it, for example, on my GitHub page here uh, and can download it or on the fin FinCiraptor homepage. And this is uh, the outcome here. So randomly chosen indices and we really get a nice fit to the input volatility surfaces. Here we have the worst case absolute error or relative error on the validation set. So and it's just for the uh, deeply out of the money options here, which is very, very small differences. So it can do a nice job in, in practice. Uh, and it's very fast. Here you see the calibration in milliseconds. It's just uh, 12 milliseconds. It, it's, it's nothing. It's, it's really, really nice. And it performs uh, really quite well. But with the applications of these neural networks, they are fast, they are accurate, uh, there comes another problem. And this is model risk. And uh, so, as I outlined, or hopefully outlined, uh, deep learning is a powerful tool and it's becoming increasingly popular because, you see, everybody is talking about that and wants to apply it in a certain area. It's all over the place uh, in photography, for example, in uh, videos and uh, um, classification of sets in medicine and so on. And now uh, people also want to apply it in finance. But finance uh, is heavily regulated and there are some requirements which are uh, formulated for example uh, the famous SR 117 poses significant obstacles to the deployment of such neural network application in the bank's production system uh, 
So the auditor, for example, might ask, so, well, you have the neural network there, you have trained it, uh, can you show me why it's working? And is it uh, chosen in a way such that um, it is somehow reasonably chosen? Is this uh, the, the least complex model uh, you apply? And we have tried to find an answer to that, which is not too complicated, uh, but uh, somehow doable in practice. And to this end, we have chosen the black scholes, a very simple, and the Heston model, a more complicated uh, uh, option pricing model. And we have considered two types of neural networks. So think about of the polynomials, one, uh, degree one, and degree 20. So the uh, network we're considering is called the long-term, short-term um, neural network here, and this is what happens in one node. It's much more complicated than a feed-forward neural network. And here is the math, if you speak math. Uh, that's uh, how the LSTM is designed, so very complex, not as easy as the um, uh, feed-forward neural network. And here I've given you the translation. I do not want to uh, read it uh, aloud here. You can go into this, but just keep in mind there's a one very Simple say, a linear function, a simple neural network, it's a uh, feed-forward, fully connected neural network, and a complex one, degree 20, it's an LSTM in here. And of course, what we observe is, uh, there are more trainable weights in the standard MLP, so the uh, feed-forward, fully connected neural network, and to the, uh, in difference to the LSTM in here. And of course, the regulator says, yeah, uh, are you using an LSTM or an, uh, um, a very simple neural network? What's best? And we try to answer that with respect to considering two different models, which are a simple one, a, Hes a black scholes, and a Heston, which is complex here. And the Heston can really produce a smile, a shape, volatility surface, whereas the black scholes is very simple in here. And that's what we have come up with. Uh, it's a grid architecture where we plot the performance of both the standard uh, neural network on Black Scholes and on Heston. And then we use here this lookup table in a way to determine which network performs best here. And what we observe actually, so despite the fact that uh, the Heston is more complex than the Black Scholes model, uh, the standard fully connected neural network is just enough to do the pricing. When it comes to other problems, the LSTM might be uh, superior, but when it comes to pricing, it does perform as good as the LSTM, has less trainable weights, has less model risk, and can even handle complex models. Anyway. So that's uh, what I wanted to show. And uh, if you want to have a look here, you can uh, consider our paper. And also Shri has uh, uploaded a notebook where you can see uh, what's happening there and can run these uh, uh, computations on your laptop in the Jupyter uh, environment and uh, yeah uh, hope you like what you heard and uh, what you saw in this uh, uh, talk in here and uh, I'm handing over to three again. Thank you so much Jörg, this was an absolute pleasure. Uh, I was also very much um, appreciative of you documenting all your code which is one of the key things which model validators you know, really appreciate. So thank you for putting those notebooks together. And those notebooks will be made available through QDOT Academy for people who are registered so that you will be able to like play with the, uh, play with the code yourselves and experience. And uh, also the slides will also be shared. Um, so next we will uh, hear from Ben about um, how do we think about model risk management in the context of alpha strategies and uh, ben, uh, I'm going to make you the presenter in a second. Give me one second. So I'm going to reclaim the host privileges and. So Ben, you're the presenter now. Okay, thank you very much. Hopefully you can see my screen. We can. And hopefully it's the one that says model risk management for deep learning and investment strategies. Absolutely, you got, you got, the, right, you got the right one. Okay, let's go then. Uh, um, so Shri, thank you 
very much. It's an honor to be invited uh, to speak at Quant University. And Jörg, thank you very much for an interesting talk. I think what I'm gonna say sort of approaches the same problem in a different use case. Uh, so what I'm gonna talk about is the problem of trying to use deep learning or deep networks or neural networks, to give them their old name, um, to build investment strategies, which are basically the systematic rules for buying and selling. So basically, can we use deep learning to predict what's gonna go up and what's gonna go down? And then model risk management here, part of that is the validation. So that's basically any model involves some risk, uh, we need to manage that. Uh, I work for BNP Paribas Asset Management. My career has been in model development, uh, running a model team, doing portfolio management. I'm now more on the uh, um, management side of things, helping with chief of staff type responsibilities and business management in the global fixed income division of BNP uh, Asset Management. Uh, I should point out the views I'm gonna talk about are my personal views. Uh, they're not uh, anything that BNP is representing. This isn't a, an official BNP presentation. I won't be talking about any BNP products. So I was curious a few years ago how we could use deep learning, and this presentation is, is the result of that. So let's get started. Um, I'm going to start with a few introductory comments, uh, but I'm going to move very quickly through them. Jörg did a great job of explaining um, the, what is machine learning and what is deep learning. But I just want to say a few things about model risk management and how, how machine learning still has model risk management. Then I'll talk about three challenges of deep learning. Uh, and then finally, I'll talk about how we actually do this, how we do this for investment strategies. Oops, that shouldn't have happened. Uh, okay, let's get started. So obviously any model is just a simplification of the real world. And model risk uh, is that we're using a bad model. How can a model be bad? Well, it could be a wrong model, uh, or it could be a model that's being used inappropriately. It is not fit for purpose. So model risk management is basically intended to minimize the consequences of using a bad model. Now, different people have different names. Um, I, I'm using these three elements of model risk management. The conceptual soundness, which is basically, are we doing something we believe to be correct? Does the strategy make sense? Is the theory that we want to be trading being applied correctly? Then there's the implementation validation. Have we implemented what we wanted to? I'm not going to spend too much time on that today. And then finally, very importantly, the ongoing monitoring. Once we put a model into production, the continuous monitoring. I'm not going to talk about the middle one of those, that the implementation side of things things like elevation and release cycles, version control, continuous integration, automated testing. I mean, that, that's like the engineering side of things. I'm not gonna touch on those. The risks I am gonna talk about today are those related to the choice of which investment strategy we use. Namely, the conceptual soundness, which is about basically, how do we decide which strategies to allocate risk to? How do we decide when to turn strategies on and which strategies to use? And then the third one, ongoing monitoring, when do we deallocate risk from them? When do we turn strategies off? So it's the first and the third that I'll talk about. George Box, all models are wrong, some are useful. Um, the funny accent, I'm currently sitting in the New York area, but obviously the funny accent and the picture behind me, I'm English like Mr. Box. Um, what, what this image is talking about is that model risk management could be concerned with how wrong our model might be. Um, Jörg did a great definition of deep learning, so I'm going to skip over this. Uh, Jörg also did a great definition of supervised, unsupervised and reinforcement. Here's basically a picture uh, of what he was talking about. Uh, the one thing I would point out, deep learning, aka neural networks, it's nothing new. Uh, supervised learning has been around for a long time. Uh, now we just have more computational power and we can build more complicated networks. There's an important question which is, is machine learning still a model? If we're talking about model risk, um, we need to know that machine learning is still a model because if it's not, then, then we need to worry about model risk management. My answer to this is yes, it is still a model. It just grew up from a different culture to traditional statistic models. Uh, there was a famous statistician at, Leo, uh, at UC Berkeley called Leo Breiman and his papers being quoted more and more and more and more recently. Uh, he, he wrote a paper back in 2001 
uh, on two different cultures, statistical modeling culture on one side and machine learning culture on the other side. Uh, it's a very short paper uh, and this cartoon sort of sums it up quite nicely, which is that um, on the left-hand side, there's a data modeler uh, or the, the traditional statistician, Feynman calls him a data modeler. And he always starts anything making some assumptions about the data generating process. And once he's done that, he selects his model and does his transformations and calibration and so on. And on the right hand side, uh, there's this guy here uh, who Brian called the algorithmic modeler, but we would recognize him as the machine learning person. And he just wants to use data. He doesn't want to impose any distribution assumptions or any structural restrictions. He just wants to make a prediction. So the key point here is that machine learning is just a set of tools using data, statistical techniques, computational power. And the second point is, it's still just finding a relationship between inputs or our independent variables and outputs or our dependent variables. Deep learning has a certain accuracy and a certain failure rate. It's still a model, so it can still be wrong. And so it still needs model risk management. I'm going to skip over the, the simple feed forward network. You did a great example. Uh, there's some slides that talk about uh, a feed forward network and an example uh, and how the feed forward network works. Uh, but let me get to the challenges. Uh, this is basically what I want to get to. Um, so of course, we can build networks and they're very easy to do now. Uh, but the nature of financial markets at different time scales comes into deciding how useful uh, what we're learning is going to be. We really want to understand how quickly the system that we're trying to model can change over time versus how much data we can collect before it changes. So deep learning needs a huge amount of data. And if our system is changing, the questions are how quickly is our system changing and how much data can we collect? Now to illustrate this, th let's think about uh, where deep learning has been successful in other domains. And some of this I'm talking about deep reinforcement learning where reinforcement learning gets blended with deep learning. Uh, but, but deep learning, when, when it's been used for autonomous vehicles, um, sure, we can collect data experimentally in real time, but by sending cars out onto the roads with sensors uh, and they can learn about the forces of nature without anyone programming them. Gravity, friction, acceleration, collision, trees being solid when the cars bump into them. Um, you know, we don't need to program this to be learned, that they can learn from their own experience. Then we can move from the physical world to another area where there's been tremendous success uh, with deep learning and deep reinforcement learning, uh, to game playing. So game playing like Atari or Go. Uh, in these spheres, not only can we collect data experimentally, but it can get done in faster than real time. So if we, we lose the shackles of the physical world, and we can have one processor, 10 processors, 1,000 processors. So the cloud can sort of be used to run things simultaneously. We also have an unlimited opportunity for trial and error experience. This is different to crashing cars into trees because obviously every car, car that crashes is out of the game and there's a cost to it. But we can play multiple games uh, simultaneously at zero cost. And finally, uh, since the rules of video games don't change, the optimal behavior that can be learned from those rules doesn't change either. And so the experience that gets learned never expires. Now, financial markets are different. Sure, we can collect data. And when I want to say I mean financial markets for trading and for investing purposes. Um, sure, we can collect data, but the factors that are affecting the prices, what drives them up and what drives them down does change. Uh, secondly, we have restricted trial and error experience. And at some point our data becomes obsolete and not representative of the future. So for deep learning, we really want three things to be there. We want to first want to collect data and learn in faster than real time. In investing, can we do that? Secondly, we want to an unlimited opportunity for trial and error. In investing, failure comes at a cost. Basically, we're losing money when we're trading. And thirdly, we want our learning experience to not change, or if it is going to change, to change very slowly. And investing, is that the case? Well, I'll leave you with that one. So, so the question really comes back to how much data can we collect versus how often do the driving factors of our system change? So I'm gonna talk about what I've called here non-stationarity as the first challenge, and that'll be the bulk of the time. And then I'll talk briefly about interpretation and briefly, finally, ensuring that the thing we learn is something new. Uh, it's a great quote from Manuel Derman. A model may be reasonable, but the world itself may be unstable. 
What's a good model today may be inappropriate tomorrow. This was said over 20 years ago, <coughs> buried in a footnote of a GS research note. Uh, so model validation, model risk management is nothing new. And recall one of the elements of model risk management, which is we wanna make sure we're um, not trading models that are no longer fit for purpose. So we wanna detect when this has happened. Um, here are three time series on the left-hand side. Uh, the top one, the, the, the single observations, the top one has a blue mean that's pretty constant. The middle one has a mean that has a little step function in it. And the bottom one has a, a, quite a sort of variable step function. Now, which of these three are a stationary process? We might wrongly conclude that only this top one is. In fact, the first one is the initial part of the second one. And the second one is the initial part of the third one. So these are all the same time series. So they are all non-stationary or stationary. They can't some be different, or maybe they can if we have different time scales. But since the description of stationary or non-stationary applies to the model data generating process, they either all are one or the other. And stationarity can be considered an assumption of the data generating process, not the observed data itself. And this is an assumption of the person building the model. So basically I could give the same data, Sri could give the same data to me as he gives to Jörg. And I might build a stationary stochastic process and Jörg might build a non-stationary deterministic process off the same data. So different modelers might make different assumptions about the data and they're imposing their beliefs about the data generating process uh, to build their model. What I really wanna do is focus on changes in the observed data, not assumptions about the modeler or from the modeler. Think back to Brian's little cartoon. Uh, so that's the first point uh, that we don't wanna make that assumption. And the second point is that change is in the time frame of the beholder. So this top one might only apply to a long-term um, uh, investor. But someone who's very high frequency could be happy working with a time series like the bottom one because their time horizons are much, much shorter. So change then can be considered in the time frame of the beholder. Uh, this is a problem with many names in different spheres. Uh, in machine learning, it's called data mining. In predictive analysis, it gets called concept drift. Uh, in pattern recognition, it gets called covariate shift or data set shift. There's lots of names for this. Uh, I've gravitated to this idea of concept drift which is when the statistical properties of the target variable that the model is trying to predict change over time in unforeseen ways. What does this mean in, in, in real language? What it means is this thing we're trying to model is moving. Uh, it's a little bit like my nine-year-old son who's playing soccer. He, he runs up the field, uh, he shoots the football at the goalposts, and all of a sudden the goalposts, they move. So the goalpost shifts. And that would be considered concept drift. The target variable that we're trying to model has moved. Concept drift by definition is unforeseen. So if we could predict it, we could deal with it. Uh, so something like this is not concept drift. Something that has drift and seasonality is not concept drift. Concept drift is things that change. The statistical properties of what we're trying to model move from one thing to something else. So given there are changes in financial markets, given the financial markets future is different to the past, we know that our training data is gonna be different to our error sample. The question is how different? So assume this is a toy illustration to sort of try to illustrate this point. Imagine we've got two states of the world. Uh, in state one, the lower state in all these diagrams, the market is driven by features in our data that our model has already learned. So in state one, we're making money, the models are profitable, the trading strategies are working, everyone's happy. State one is good. Uh, state two is the market is being driven by features that are unknown to our model. They haven't yet been learned. Uh, state one is learned, state two is something else. Now they might be learnable over time, but as of now, they're not learned. So the question is how we move between those two states. And we might move suddenly, we might move incrementally, we might move backwards and forwards. And the key question is which ones of these happening are happening at which time? And these are not exhaustive, this is just illustrative. In the real world, they all happen at the same time. So basically uh, they're all interplaying and they're hard to disentangle from each other. 
But remember one of our sources of model risk, an incorrectly applied model. If the world has changed around us and we're still trading a model that was trained on the old world, that's what we're really, really worried about. And that's what we're trying to detect. And, and to emphasize, um, this is an illustrative example in, in two dimensions, just one time series. To emphasize, this isn't, uh, I'm not really worried about individual time series. What I'm really worried about is the system of interrelated variables that change how they impact each other. And that's what's really important. And we know this comes out in lots of ways. Uh, we know the correlation structure between asset returns can change over time. We know the data available to market participants changes. Um, think about all the alternative data that, that's now available that wasn't five or 10 years ago. And then most importantly, the relative import to drive investment decisions, the data has to be available, and then also we have to use it. So why is this important? Well, if we understand when and how concept drift is expected to occur, in which markets, over which time frames, that can help us understand where deep learning can help us build viable investment strategies and where we shouldn't even try. So the big questions that are open at the moment are, how much data is enough? How much data does deep learning really need? And how can expected change in markets be measured? So can we quantify and predict which type of concept drift is gonna happen? Is it gonna be a sudden step change or is it gonna be incremental? Where we have lots of data and a small degree of concept drift, that's a good place to use deep learning. Where we have not much data and lots of expected concept drift, there we don't even wanna try uh, and use deep learning at all. So that was the first challenge. And I'll, I'll talk about some of the practical um, use of this uh, in the last part of, of this talk. I briefly wanna talk about the other two challenges just very, very briefly. One of them is on interpretation. Uh, why is interpretation important? It's all about trust. We have to trust that if a strategy is losing money, and at some point, a lot of them do, the portfolio manager needs to have the confidence in the strategy to stick with it. And we also need the trust to demonstrate to our clients and their consultants when they do due diligence to gain their trust. We need to demonstrate that we understand why any investment strategy is doing what it's doing. So there's lots of um, possible meanings of interpretation. The one I think that's gaining traction amongst sort of portfolio managers is the idea of post hoc interpretability. And that is when we have something other than a quantifiable measure to explain what the learning is predicting. We don't explain how it's learning. We don't explain uh, why the algorithm is doing what they're doing. We just want to use examples to explain what is going on uh, and why certain things are being suggested for buys and sells. And I think that last one is the most relevant one uh, for us. But the other thing I wanted to say briefly on this one, and uh, Jörg showed a TensorFlow graphic, and so I've also got a TensorFlow graphic, uh, is just to point out that if you do use that, it will highlight the weights that are used at each node. Look at the weights, because that can give you quite a good indication on a small enough sized uh, network on which ones are important and which ones aren't. So the weight of each uh, line is proportional to the weight of each node. So if a, a node has a very thin line, it's not getting much input. If there's very thin lines coming from the initial input data, it means they're not being used. Um, so it, it's not complicated maths. It's just look at the networks that we're using. And to echo Jörg's point, so sometimes simple is better. Uh, the next challenge, challenge number three, uh, some, one of the accusations that deep learning has had leveled at it is sometimes it's learning things we already know. It tells us to follow strategies that we already know. And this actually is uh, good because we can't be learning something that we can identify as something we know and at the same time having an interpretation challenge. And this leads on to one very big use of deep learning, uh, which is evaluating new data sets for orthogonal value. And I'll, I'll spend a few moments on this. Um, it's very simple. Uh, the solution is to build a traditional multi-factor model for investment strategies value, momentum, size, illiquidity, low vol, and so on. Then there's a residual from that. We've always taken this to be the, the error or the, the, the idiosyncratic risk that we can't model. However, that residual is now the most important part because we can take that residual 
and we can use that as the target for our deep learning. Uh, and if we can throw alternative data sets in, and if we can explain that residual, uh, that means we've learned something orthogonal to our existing factors. Now, the benefit of this is it's a fast way to process and evaluate all the new data sets that are out there at the moment. Uh, it would take, to do it the old fashioned way, uh, a large team of quants doing everything individually. Uh, it still like, takes a fairly large team, but now we can build a scalable model uh, that, is, that's, that can be considered efficient. So uh, the maths behind that, um, the return on asset i at time t is a function of the alpha, which is the idiosyncratic return, uh, the beta, which is the common factor loadings, the f, which is the return for those common factors, uh, and then this epsilon. And this epsilon was historically the error term, the bit that we couldn't explain. Uh, to sort of vectorize all this, this epsilon is now the most important part, which is the return on asset i at time t from unknown factors. And if we can use a deep network to explain those unknown in fact, as we've got some useful input data going in. And now I want to come in the last, I'll limit it to 10 minutes, maybe a bit quicker. I want to talk about how we do this. So we've got investment strategies. How do we know if they're any good? Uh, we talked about conceptual soundness at the beginning when we allocate risk to a strategy that we evaluate via backtesting. We talked about ongoing monitoring, when to turn a strategy off. So I'll give a few examples of those. The good news is we can make backtests. The bad news is we keep making back tests till the cows come home. Uh, no one has ever shown me a bad back test. Those are the ones that get left in the bottom drawer and never get shown to anyone. Uh, so we know it, we can't believe the absolute return of the back test, but there is things we can do with them. We can look at a number of different evaluations, uh, return per unit risk, alpha decay, temporal PNL, strategy correlation, sensitivity, and so on. I'll, I'll show a few examples of these now in the last few minutes. So we can look at the alpha decay of a strategy backtest, which basically shows if we plot the delay of implementing. So if we don't delay, if we don't trade a strategy in a backtest when we should, but in fact, we do it one time period later or two time periods later or three time periods later against the a measure of risk adjusted return. If we trade it when we should, we get something like here. If we trade it periods later, the alpha term structure shows us how the alpha will decay. What we want to see is something like this. It decays slowly, because that means we don't have to trade immediately. If we have to trade quickly, uh, generally it's not a good thing, because if we have to do something, uh, somebody else is going to be charging us to do that. So we want to have a bit of time in this strategy. This is what we don't want to see. This shows that we have to trade the strategy immediately, or we just get random noise left. And this last one shows us something suspicious has happened. Uh, so this is one way of evaluating the methodology used by the, re the developer or the model developer or the, the quant researcher to evaluate what they've done. If they invent a strategy that uh, delaying doesn't make any difference, uh, one or two things have happened. Either they've done something wrong uh, or, or introduced an undocumented feature, as we like to say, uh, or uh, we're evaluating this over an, an inappropriate time scale. So just one way of getting a bit more of a feeling behind the backtest. Then the next one is about uh, temporal PNL. How do apologies? Uh, how do the back tests look over time? Not just do they start in the bottom left and go to the top right. Uh, these three strategies have the same long run risk adjusted return, but they get there in different ways. They get there. The first one by going. Oh, there we go. Uh, the first one up and along, the second one up and down, up and down, and the third one, uh, so it doesn't do too well to start with, it does very well at the end. So what's going on? Is there secular decay? Is this cyclical? Or is this something like the concept earlier where the nature of the markets themselves have changed over time? Now, personally, I would much rather be working and implementing this bottom strategy, which seems to be getting better, uh, perhaps less so than the top one. But there's a lot more that we want to know about these things. But at least that, that asks, we want to ask some questions about them. The next slide is on strategy sensitivity. The back test can tell us how our strategy has done in relation to what's been going on in the past. And importantly, in what environments does it do well? And in what environments does it do badly? So here's three strategies that do well and differently at different times. Um, but more importantly, what a strategy sensitivity can tell us is what we don't know. So basically, under what conditions 
has the strategy not been tested in the past? And if we go into one of those environments in live trading, we want to pay attention, perhaps deallocate risk, perhaps turn it off, or at the very least be a bit more mindful of what's going on. So the back test tells us a lot of things, but it also tells us what we don't know. So what macro variables, what environmental variables, or what uh, microstructure variables could come to play that we have not tested things against? Think of volatility regimes, think of underlying equity markets, think of interest rate regimes, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, random portfolios. Uh, we can use randomized portfolios to test if our strategy really is any good or if it rather has been uh, benefiting from some kind of beta in the market that just was doing well by being long the market. Uh, the top left would be long run exposure. Uh, the top right would be it's actually doing well. These random portfolios are generated with random weights at the same level of risk as our original portfolio. There's no deep learning here. These are just really like monkeys throwing darts at a dartboard uh, this is designed to give us a bit of perspective, but also this bottom left tells us uh, if the quant research or model developer might have done something that's a little bit too good to be true. Uh, so if I see the bottom left, that would indicate maybe I think we need to check in a bit more detail. Uh, the fifth evaluation we can do is we can randomize our returns. We can intentionally create noise. We can break the covariance and break the structure between our returns and our features. Basically, we can basically pour random noise into our network and see what happens. It should fail to learn anything. It should tell us not to trade. And it should result in lots of random um, outcomes that are near zero. If, if it doesn't, we've got a problem with our structure. So that was five ways to look at a back test. I'll say now a few words uh, on monitoring and then I'll wrap up. So we wanna keep an eye on what the strategy is doing both in terms of PL, both in terms of trades, and in terms of any assumptions in the real world. Uh, remember that Derman quote about the world being unstable. We want to turn models down or off or deallocate risk before we've lost a lot of money. So of course, we can compare distributions between simulation and out of sample. But by the time we've got a big enough out of sample distribution, it probably means we've lost a lot of money. And remember, one of the problems with financial markets, we don't have an unlimited opportunity for trial and error. You know, losses are losses. Uh, so basically, we can use um, what, what was called uh, statistical process control, uh, which I always call a small sample problem. Uh, it's very unglamorous. It's not big data. It's not data science-y. Uh, but it's basically, if you expect a certain number of outcomes to be a certain number of standard deviations away in a certain period of time, and you suddenly start seeing more of them, uh, pay attention. And then finally, just to wrap all this up, uh, we talked about the model risk management is controlling for the risk that a, a model is wrong or a bad model. We talked about machine learning based strategies still being models. So we still need to um, do model risk management. Didn't spend too much, but Jörg mentioned that deep learning can detect anything. Deep learning can be used to train or fit any nonlinear relationships to any data in training data. So the key question is, how different is our training data from our outer sample? There's a number of challenges. Uh, financial markets are different to other areas where deep learning is having huge success. The key to knowing where deep learning can be useful in finance and investing, specifically this use case, is how fast is the market changing and how much data do we need? Uh, what I'd love is a measure of concept drift versus data collection. And so there we can determine where and for which assets deep learning can be successfully used. Uh, there is a challenge around interpretation that a lot of people are talking about. Uh, my hint there or my advice there is use small enough networks that are manageable and look at the weights. Uh, don't throw the weights away. Don't just plug and play. Um, and we can avoid learning what you already know uh, by using the residuals from a traditional factor model. There's lots of ways to do model risk management for trading strategies and investment strategies. They start with a back test, but they're not related to the highest sharp ratio. Um, we, we can look at before performance decays, we can understand what performance is correlated with, uh, we can understand how seconds, if I may. One of the biggest problems with deep learning now if anything, is that it's too easy. 
We have huge amounts of processing power with GPUs and cloud clusters. There's huge, huge amounts Uh, did we lose? Did we lose Ben? Um, looks like we lost him for a second. Probably Zoom issues. Um, so uh, I'm sorry about that. I think he's going to join. I think there's a little bit of a network lag. Um, it's 12:42. So when Ben comes back, we'll see if we can kind of uh, do a quick wrap up. Um, so. Uh, what we're going to do now is, Yark, can you still hear us? I'm on, yes. Okay, good. So uh, let's start with the Q&A, and hopefully Ben's going to join us. Uh, so this was an excellent presentation. Thank you, Yark, and uh, thank you, Ben, for this excellent presentation and overview. Um, what I'm going to do for the next few minutes, uh, hopefully Ben's going to join, is uh, uh, I was multitasking, and I was able to get your code onto our sandbox. So I'm gonna do a quick demo, that way people can see how they can access the, the code. Um, so give me one second, let me just um, get to the Q Academy um, and then share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, good. So this is uh, the Q Academy and for people who don't know, we have been running all the classes through Q Academy in the last six months. And we have a couple of different courses going on. We have a machine learning and finance course, a data science with Python course, a model risk management course, and we have also some courses on MATLAB and some anomaly detection, et cetera. And uh, all the summer school lectures, which we have been doing over the last nine weeks are available when you filter into the Q lecture series. Um, so I'm going to give you information on how to access all the content in here. So you'll be able to access each one of these lectures, the slides, and the associated demos. So for today's presentation, uh, we will, uh, when you go into the link, you will be able to see all the video for today and then uh, the slides which uh, Yarg and uh, Ben presented. Now the code which uh, Yarg demonstrated, so you just need to click on Run on Q Sandbox. And what that's going to give you is the two Google, uh, the Jupyter Notebooks, which uh, Yarg has shared with me. Um, so when you click on that, we have just put it on Cool App. That way you don't have to worry about downloading and installing and everything. So you should be able to see uh, the Jupyter Notebook. And uh, since it comes with uh, TensorFlow and Keras installed with that, you should be able to run the notebook here. If you have uh, specific requirements in terms of um, packages, you will be also able to install it in here. Or if you are interested in kind of scaling your hardware, you can just take the Jupyter Notebook and then run it on your own local hardware or a cloud-based instance with dedicated GPUs. So that's uh, the first notebook. And then the second notebook is the network topology one, which uh, Yark shared. Uh, so that's also available in here. So you'll be able to download both the Jupyter Notebooks and play with it. On the sandbox, um, we have dedicated hardware resources. So for people who are interested in trying it out, please do let me know. I can see if we can put it on our boxes and give you access to it. But since these two are generic enough and does not require very many packages, you should be able to play with in the, in the Google Notebook setting. So uh, just a brief uh, review of uh, how to get there. Uh, I'll be putting the slide deck also on the page, but for people who are listening in, uh, there uh, you just need to go into the academy.qsandbox.com. It's also www.q.academy. And when you register, just register with the code Q Summer School so that you get access to all the contents and the labs associated with it. And as I gave you instructions, you should be able to like you know click on the sandbox and run through all the labs. Okay, so that's uh, a quick orientation on how to access the code. Now, what I'm going to do is uh, just uh, uh, start with the Q&A. Hopefully, Ben is back. Hey, Ben, can you hear us? 
Uh, I think he's still joining in. Uh, his microphone looks muted um, and his video also looks muted. So um, Jörg, we have a couple of questions coming in. So let's start answering the questions and uh, hopefully uh, when Ben joins in, we can kind of, you know, share the microphone. So Ben, um, you know, uh, the Zoom model validation. I'm back in. So Zoom, uh, I think, dropped you. Um, so I'm glad you're back. Uh, do you have any specific uh, final comments before we move to the Q&A section? I think his screen is freezing again. That's fine. Um, so let's, let's kind of... Okay, so I think we lost you a little bit, Ben. Um, so the first question is, uh, how do you handle AI bias risk in terms of, let's say, gender or bias in algorithms and data? So I think it's a, a kind of a generic question from Pamela Jasper. Uh, do you have any thoughts on it, Yark? Uh, so I didn't really get uh, the last sentence. Uh, was it on ben, for Ben or for me? Um, either one of you can take the question. It's how do you handle bias in your data? Uh, for example, uh, gender or race bias in an algorithm or in data sets. Okay, uh, so that's a, a problem. And uh, um, even if you work with uh, synthetic data, say, so for example, if you create some uh, um, data, which, which I would use, for example, for uh, uh, training a neural net in a Heston world or in a Saber world, where I have to produce uh, the labels from uh, given input data, mm -hmm. uh, I had the problem that I used, for example, a PDE for right. solving that and get uh, uh, the training data. And uh, what I wasn't aware of actually was uh, uh, when I created uh, uh, the labeled data, uh, I used a certain grid for the PDE. Mm -hmm. And for some strange parameter sets, uh, the PDE couldn't really calculate the price accurately. So it uh, just went off for a l very large strike. For example, mm -hmm. if I use the smile and I wanted to parameterize and calculate the smile and I would use a, a, a too small grid in the PDE, it cuts off as a certain level. For uh, example, five times the forward or something. And uh, I really wasn't aware that I uh, uh, didn't do uh, uh, cope uh, with this problem, but after training the neural network, and uh, testing some data sets, it uh, found out that the uh, um, worst performing uh, set was some set where somehow the strike uh, or, or the, the smile went down to zero again. Mm -hmm. uh, that was really strange. So and therefore I had started to investigate. And I think this is always a, a back and forth. Uh, you, you do something, you have to be sure that the input data is really right. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, uh, sometimes you realize it when you apply the neural net and plot certain things and investigate that something got uh, gone wrong. And then you can start digging for the uh, error. But it's not obvious, actually. And uh, it's uh, the usual rule, uh, garbage in, garbage out. So uh, you have always to keep track on uh, uh, the input data. So you have to adjust it, uh, do quality checks, maybe run some AI uh, uh, stuff on uh, checking for, for outliers or something so mm -hmm. that you somehow get alarmed when something seems to be not right. Uh, but uh, uh, that's really a problem and you cannot uh, circumvent it by some uh, uh, standard deep learning procedure or something. It's Absolutely. something you have to do. Absolutely. And uh, I think, uh, you know, for just, just to kind of uh, allude to some of the things we have done at the summer school, we had a whole session on explainable AI and we had a segment on uh, bias and we also had a segment on fairness and a segment on interpretability and explainability. And in the fairness segment, uh, we talked about some of the open source packages which are available. And one of them is the AIF 360, which is put out by IBM. They have uh, both uh, uh, a set of metrics which you can use to evaluate bias from a cross-sectional data perspective. And, and they also have some methodologies for mitigating bias. And it's also available on QDAR Academy. If you wanna try, just send me a note and I'll give you access to that particular demo wherein you could take a cross-sectional data set and play around with it. Uh, you can potentially look at like specific, you know, uh, uh, features and then figure out whether you want to evaluate bias from those features or other aspects of it. Um, so Ben, uh, can you hear us now? 
I can. I apologize the network issues. Hope oh, no is worries. Better. You're not responsible for the network. So <laughs> uh, like, uh, thank you for coming back. Um, so I'll probably give you the next question. So uh, this is a very contextual question. In today's day and age, we have to think about how life was before COVID and how life's going to be after COVID. And the same goes with models. Um, so how do you decide to recalibrate an existing model for, uh, you know, for example, if, if a model had been calibrated for mm -hmm. pre-COVID era and now it's post-COVID? Uh, it's a yeah. very question. How, what are your thoughts about that? Well, if I limit my sort of answer to sort of the problem that I was talking about, you know, the, the investing strategies type uh, approach and the training mm -hmm. strategies type approach uh, and, and generalize it to actually, when do we recalibrate anyway? Yeah. Um, so so the, the general answer is recalibrate when we know the data that we're seeing out of sample is different to the data that we've trained on. Mm -hmm. so the question then is, it, it comes from uh, having a deep understanding of the data that we're using. Uh, maybe I can ask apologies. How much of of the presentation um, did you see? Did I did I lose you a long time before the end? Or no, I no, I think uh, we, we it was probably you were wrapping up more or less. Okay, uh, so, so no, I, I mentioned very briefly about strategy monitoring, uh, and the key thing is when a model isn't performing as intended, that's mm -hmm. when to recalibrate. So the question is, how should a model be performing as intended? Well, it means from my the, the problems that I was working was working here. What is the PL that's expected on different time horizons, different trades? But also, what are the assumptions and what are the sort of the meta characteristics about a trading strategy? Mm -hmm. So, the number of trades being generated, the size of the trades being generated, the volatility of the trades being generated. So, the, the, the not necessarily assumptions that we've given to the model, but the artifacts that come out of the develop, model development, when there's sufficient differences between mm -hmm. the artifacts from model development and the real live trading, that's absolutely when we should recalibrate. Now, in some cases, COVID will you know, perhaps put a line on things and things will be very different before and very different afterwards. Yeah. In some cases, there might be just a gradual evolution. So we decay data. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so the next question is about uh, hyperparameter grids and how do you look at the combination of hyperparameters when you're doing tuning for neural networks? Um, so I'll kind of just step back a little bit. I think Jigger was asking is asking a question. Uh, when you have limited compute resources, if you are a fintech and you're putting stuff on the cloud and uh, you don't want to run through all the billion combinations of hyperparameters to figure out like what's the best one, right? Um, so how do you estimate infrastructure and time it's going to take to uh, do hyperparameter tuning? But I also want to set the stage in the context of a model validator because you know if the model developers have come up with a set of hyperparameters and then they tell the validators that this is this is the best we could how would they use different tools and i have a perspective on it i'll kind of share it but i was just curious if you guys had worked on similar problems and how do you how do you kind of look at it uh, in the context of cost benefit of using all possible combinations versus let's do the best we can with whatever constraints we're going to put in yeah, so maybe I can start. Uh, uh, so, of course, if you're working in a, in a bank, I think uh, uh, if you want to apply this stuff and uh, you say uh, uh, that you're keen to do it and uh, you see uh, uh, somehow um, a rationale for doing that, I think in this case, maybe cost uh, is uh, uh, not the, the, the main problem in a way. So mm -hmm. if you are, of course, a, a personal user or a, a fintech, uh, I think uh, what you should do in the beginning is uh, you have to clearly think about uh, what you deem to be a, a, an appropriate structure for a network. So, for example, um, in, in our case, we used some extreme uh, different networks like this LSTM and the uh, DNN in a way. Uh, but we always had in mind that the DNN might be uh, the one mm -hmm. which performs quite well in this case. We just wanted to show... Uh, the stuff from um, a point of view uh, that there are differences and if uh, um, yeah, uh, how we can compare it. It's, it. It is just an example. So we wouldn't go for LSTMs in option pricing, for example. Mm -hmm. So this could be something where we just narrow the horizon of networks already. And uh, then we can, uh, of course, uh, uh, think about of then setting up a grid. Of course, it's time consuming, uh, but in uh, the current 
times, I think NVIDIA just released a very nice uh, graphic card, or it's called Tensor Processing Unit. Uh, I think it's in a reasonable range of maybe 3,000 euros, maybe mm -hmm. 4,000 euros. And uh, yeah, so I think we are in this range. You're talking about the RTX, 3, the RTX 30 series or? Uh, yeah, this uh, uh, RX 13, uh, 3080 or something like this with 10,946 CUDA uh, cores and 24 mm -hmm. gigs of RAM. So I think it's somehow it's getting affordable in a way. And uh, uh, otherwise uh, you need some time. But I think I would suggest to narrow the horizon of different uh, architectures and so on and then um, I, I also wouldn't do uh, testing maybe with uh, 10 nodes and uh, one layer, for example. So okay. just uh, cooking it down to a reasonable size and then doing some uh, extrapolation maybe or interpolation. If you see you have it for extremes, it might be somewhere in the middle. Yeah, just decrease the number of uh, scenarios that you want to, uh, to run and then uh, uh, this can quite help. Uh, uh, starting with some thinking and cooking it down and uh, not just doing full computational power and uh, uh, yeah, uh, trying everything. It's a, not a complete denumeration. It should be somehow narrowed down. Absolutely. Absolutely. Ben, do you have a wheel? Uh, yeah, I, I'd echo that. It's not throw everything at the wall and see what sticks and try right. every single architecture and see what fits. That, that's absolutely not the way to go. Um, there has to be some sort of hypothesis that feed forward versus feedback versus convolution versus it's, yeah. Yeah, there has to be some belief what, what is driving the thing that we're trying to model um, will be one side. And then I'm say a brief comment from a validation perspective, which is if we're talk talking about structured networks, it's one thing if we're talking about the like number of iterations or epochs or batches, that's something else or depth of layers or number of neurons and so on. Uh, one of the great questions a validator should always ask a model developer is, you know, if you change the number of layers, what happens? If you change the number of neurons, what happens? Um, and uh, yeah, I, th I think that is a good answer because if you get a very different result by making a very small change, as we know, that's kind of not really robust. So that's one one good thing to keep in mind. Absolutely, and uh, this is uh, you know a shameless product bug, and that's why we built the Q sandbox, the sandbox for experimentation, uh, because we deal with the problem always whenever you have multiple architecture choices, multiple machine learning algorithms, and when you are thinking about structuring different problems to try it out, you basically have to make sure that you experiment before you confirm what the right architecture is going to be. So we, um, you know, when I kind of validate external models or even when you're designing algorithms, so we kind of take a very rudimentary approach. So even when we talk about like number of epochs, we don't start with like, okay, let's try 10,000 epochs. So we use TensorBoard heavily to see if we are running these epochs, how's my error rate going down or whatever performance metric we are looking at. So we visualize it and we kind of get a feel for it. But in addition to that, there have been some you know, new research looking at the whole notion of you know, learning about the parameters, about the parameter space itself. So many of the AutoML uh, related research is to figure out like, you know, when you have a particular network architecture, how do you think about potentially learning about the relationship between uh, amongst the various hyperparameters. That way you can potentially do a smart decision in terms of choosing these hyperparameters rather than uh, looking at the hyperparameters as a grid and then looking at possible combinations or potentially randomly choosing different hyperparameter choices when you're trying to optimize. So there are some, there are some uh, potential research out there you can look into. Okay, so I think we discussed one question. So we'll take that question and uh, we'll probably adjourn for today. Um, so the notion of this P versus Q points and um, how do you see the world in the context of, um, on the one hand, you have technologies which are frontier technologies, which we are seeing every day, a new potential architecture come up, a new way of doing things. And uh, some of them are trying to well, let's see. Let's use what these. Uh, let's see what these technologies do. And they are the champions, and they're bringing in all these technologies in the financial services enterprise. On the other hand, there are the skeptics, wherein they are like very risk averse. I mean, my uh, my linear model works. My regression model works. And if I cannot explain, I'm not going to go anywhere further than what I can potentially explain. So, and then you have a whole spectrum of potential users. And I think most people are evolving their knowledge and their experience in terms of going more and more towards 
uh, machine learning and other sophisticated techniques. So how do you see the world from your perspective? You know, if you're a peak one, where do you see the opportunities are, where do you see the challenges are, both from a usability and also an adoption perspective, because you need to be selling these within your enterprise, but also from a QPON perspective. Uh, so uh, Ben, you want to go first and then sure. Jark, potentially share your Sure, so I, I, I guess I'm the peak one then, uh, living in the real world. So. <laughs> um, so, so basically the intended use of any of these models from, from the investment structure is, does this model make money out of sample? Pure and simple. Okay, it's not about goodness of fit in sample. So to your question about you know cutting edge versus um, you know sticking with with the traditional, I, I definitely see similarities between deep learning now and sort of Markowitz mean variance from the 1950s. So in the 1950s, Markowitz published his seminal paper that said you know assume we have return, we know the returns of every instrument. Here is the optimal way to allocate a portfolio. The, the key word is assume. And then over the next decades, I guess next 50 years, because people are still doing it, um, we've modified mean variance to sort of anticipate for the fact that we don't actually know the returns in, in the future. Um, you know, there's distributional assumptions, there's, there's putting views into it, there's using sort of resampling, there's lots of ways to do it, but mm -hmm. so there's been lots of building on that foundation. So where we are with deep learning right now for investment strategies is that if, and big if, the past was exactly the same as the future or the trading data was it was similar enough to our uh, next period of time uh, then it's hugely popular i think we'll, we'll spend the next few years and probably some companies doing this already you know adapting the deep learning architecture to anticipate for the fact that we don't actually have an, a big um in sample data set as representative of the future so i think it, it's a gradual pathway on different organizations at different levels uh, the key criteria is how much data they have so the higher frequency um, organizations have more data points to play with. So I think they're there first. Yeah. Jark, you want to you have a view on that? Yes, of course. So, so in the QPOINT area, I think uh, we are currently uh, moving in the direction uh, that we might be able to use more complicated models. So for mm -hmm. example, I presented the Heston model as a, right. as a showcase, of course. Uh, but there are models out there, for example, rough volatility models or uh, models with a high number of parameters, which uh, are only uh, available, uh, say, in classical terms using Monte Carlo simulation, which is very time consuming and you cannot hope really to calibrate such a model in due time. But with these new techniques, I think you can create all your data beforehand with Monte Carlo, maybe let the computer run for a week produce mm -hmm. all the, uh, uh, the labels and then you train a neural network and then watch, uh, you can calibrate a rough stochastic wall model or something more complicated as for example, this risk fuel uh, methodology, this pricer shows, you can mm -hmm. calculate any Bermudan option, any uh, length of the underlying swap within a fraction of a second. Whereas standard methods take much more time. But of course you have to aware, you have to be aware uh, that uh, the neural network cannot really extrapolate. So if you right. run out of the region where you have trained the neural network, you might run into problems. So mm -hmm. therefore, in a in a historical simulation or in a simulation for calculating VAR somehow, I think you have to, uh, uh, to, to really restrict your parameters where it's safe to use the neural network. But if your path in a Monte Carlo simulation, mm -hmm. for, for example, runs out of this space, you have to rely on classic methods. But in the broad of the distribution, it can add so much value in terms of speed and accuracy uh, that it is really beneficial in there. So, uh, yeah, but always take care uh, where you apply these neural networks. Absolutely. And I mean, you know, machine learning models are typically generalizers, right? So they work yeah. really well with the bulk of the data. So I think it kind of also touches upon some of the things you were alluding to, which is potentially using some synthetic data to also factor in some of the edges or the edge use cases to make it much more uh, robust in the context of the model being aware of the plausible solutions. Um, so I think that's a fascinating discussion for maybe another day, but Ben, you wanted to add something? Yeah, maybe just one sort of uh, epilogue to the final comment. Uh, in, in the P space, obviously the, the deep networks are having tremendous success in sort of foundational elements to the investment mm -hmm. process. So turning unstructured data into structured data, yeah. video, images, text, or so on, or automating uh, things that sort of need to be automated. So I think sort of to echo Jörg's point about sort of the speed, the accuracy, the dealing with uh, automation 
uh, mm -hmm. in the in the foundational levels of the investment process uh, we're already seeing um, perhaps um, yeah cool so this this was a fascinating discussion i wish we could extend this discussion for the next couple of hours and then uh, uh, yarg it's almost october first time i guess so it would have been nice to you know get a couple of uh, october first beers and sit and have a fun discussion uh, but uh, looking forward to continuing the discussion online. And thank you so much for making time for us uh, this afternoon and evening for you, York. Um, and Ben, thank you so much again for your uh, uh, fascinating presentation always. I love to see the presentation again and again. That's probably one of the reasons why I, I say bring, bring the same presentation, I guess. So um, i love to love to continue the discussion again. Thank you so much again. And uh, for uh, people who are in the audience, as I mentioned, the slides and the code which you are sent out will be shared to you by uh, email you know, with the, you're registered. So you'll be getting an email about that and stay tuned for future sessions in the next few weeks and also for the upcoming fall session. Uh, we're gonna have uh, many more uh, fascinating topics on FinTech, scalable machine learning, interpretability, explainability, and various topics, which uh, I hope you're gonna enjoy and continue to learn as we ride out the crisis and also get ready to leverage the new opportunities which are going to be there out there thank you again and uh, we'll stay connected see you bye-bye thank you bye-bye thank you day. thank you very much thank you bye bye, bye.